Hi, welcome to Coursera's Instrumental Analysis class. I'm Vicki Colvin. We're in week four, and in the second lecture, I'm going to be talking about retention time, kind of a qualitative treatment. Really, my goals here are to have you understand the chemical origins of retention time. Why do things come out later or earlier from a chromatography column? I want you to think about, kind of in a microscopic way, what's happening to the sort of bolus of material you shoved into the column as a function of time. And I want you to be able to link the column retention time to the polarity of molecules, which is a really fundamental idea that we're going to be seeing again and again in chromatography. Here's a chromatogram in the lower left, and as you can see, there are three peaks. So why does one substance come out really fast and another substance come out slower? Well, some definitions to start with. First of all, the very first peak you see in a chromatogram is going to be called T sub M, the mobile phase peak. It might not actually be the mobile phase, but for a variety of reasons, that's how it's referred to. Sometimes it's called the solvent peak, but it's almost always T sub M is the time that you see that first peak come out. And that's sort of considered to be an important reference point for the rest of your retention times. Now, the other times that peaks come out at are called retention times, or T sub R. So you may have a lot of different components in the thing you're analyzing, and they should all come out at different times because of the chemistry that they have, as we'll talk about in this lecture. And so often, when you do a chromatography experiment, you create a table where you might report all the different retention times of your system. And if you report retention time, you just mean raw time that it takes to come through the column. So why does one come out early and one come out late? I like to use, when I think about chromatography, this visual image of a stream with uh, rocks at the bottom of the stream and things moving in the stream. You know, it might be pieces of dirt, it might be a piece of wood, but in any case, I think of the stream flowing as my mobile phase. I think of the whole stream itself and, and especially the rocks at the bottom of the stream as my stationary phase. And I would point out that the term column is a little bit vague. Sometimes it's used to refer to just the stationary phase, and sometimes it's used to refer to the whole casing and everything that holds the stationary phase. But it's almost always got something to do with the fixed phase that's present in a chromatography system. And the mobile phase is said to elute through the column, and it's also called the eluent. So if we dig into my stream bed analogy a little bit deeper to understand why does something come through fast and something else come through slow, well, here's my diagram of the stream. So here's some additional def definitions. The water has a flow rate. Mills per minute is a very common one for chromatography. It's called also the eluent, and it's carrying analytes with it. And those analytes, and as you can see down here, here's the stream bed with some rocks at the bottom. Those analytes can get hung up. And I'm going to just use that word for now. They can get hung up on the stream bed. And so if an analyte gets hung up on the stream bed for two seconds, then during those two seconds, it doesn't actually have any velocity. And so the mobile phase is passing it through. And then if it goes back into the mobile phase, then all of a sudden it moves again. Basically, interactions with the stationary phase retard the motion of analytes. They make them go slower. So it's the interaction with the stationary phase that defines when something comes out. And I should say very carefully, actually, it's also the differential, because the mobile phase also has an effect, as I'll show you in now. Really what's going on is molecules, as they're moving down a column, are every moment of that transit being faced with the decision, do I stay in the mobile phase, or do I go visit the stationary phase beneath me? And the decision that they're faced with, do I stay in the mobile phase or go into the stationary phase, is actually a decision driven by thermodynamics, which is where are they going to have the lowest free energy, in the mobile phase or in the stationary phase? And it's not a yes-no answer. It's kind of a proportionality. So the reality is, if you have 10 to the 21 molecules floating down your chromatography column, at any given snapshot, you could take a picture at a certain place in the stream, and you're going to find some of the molecules are going to be in the stationary phase, or actually dissolve into it. That's where the stream bed analogy sort of doesn't work. You can't dissolve into a rock, but bear with me. And let's say 20% are there, and 80% are still in the water. And then if you go time five seconds later, you'll still have that 80%, 20%, but the whole analytes will have moved a little bit more. The percentage and how much the time the analyte decides to spend in the stationary phase is really what's going to govern how long 
they take to go through the column. If there's a lot of interaction with the stationary phase and they really partition into that phase, then they're going to move very slowly. The word partition is an important one because it's actually the foundation for the quantitative analysis of retention time. So let's look a little bit more closely at what I just said. So say we have analyte A and B, and they're starting off in a column, which is what that blue stuff is. And what you really can envision that axis to be on the left is the concentration. And so analyte A is clearly more in the mobile phase than it is in the stationary phase, whereas analyte B really likes to be in the stationary phase. So let's see what happens as a function of time to this sort of injection of material into our column. And remember, in your head, there's a mobile phase that's sweeping over this, usually going a lot faster than either one of these analytes. Well, at time t equal 2, analyte A has moved, and so has analyte B, but not as much. And there's a couple of different things that are going on. First off, analyte A has moved further because it spends less time associated with the stationary phase. So it's net velocity, because every time something associates the stationary phase, remember it slows down. And you might wonder then, why doesn't the peak in the top just separate and move with the mobile phase, and there's a peak in the bottom that doesn't move? And the reason for that is that there's something called a chemical potential. If that were to happen, there would actually be a break there would be a concentration in, in, the mo in the stationary phase and zero above it. And that actually costs a huge thermodynamic price. So there's something called a dynamic equilibrium that's being set up. And so basically, if the, some of the molecules have decided to spend time in the stationary phase, the easiest analogy is that the ones in the mobile phase have to wait and dynamically equilibrate as they're moving. They can't just get ahead. The one stuff in the mobile phase can't really get ahead of the stuff in the stationary phase. So that dynamic equilibrium is then set up for both analyte A and analyte B. And so these move through the column as a function of time with some fraction of the material at any given snapshot in the stationary phase and some fraction of it in the mobile phase. And as you can see, analyte A is moving a lot faster. So t equal 4, analyte A's come out of the column. And remember, what we're going to do then is detect it and see a signal. So our chromatogram is going to go up and down, telling us that analyte A is now out of the column. Meanwhile, slowpoke analyte B, which is really interrogating and likes to be in the stationary phase, is taking a lot longer. And so it goes to t equals 6 before it comes out of the column, and we see that. So in this chromatogram, you would see two peaks, one at 4 and one at 6. Now, let's go over some practice questions to see how you're doing with these concepts. I want you to take a look at these questions, maybe stop the video and try to answer them. Okay, so what's the peak at one minute called? I called it a couple of different things. It's definitely T sub M peak. We'll call it the solvent peak or the mobile phase peak. So which analyte A or B spent more time in the stationary phase? Well, B came out later, so it was definitely spending more time there. So definitely B. Now a tougher question. What fraction of time did A and B spend in the stationary phase? Can you get it from this data? And you can, because we know that the retention time, which is let's say eight minutes, is equal to the time that B spent hanging around in the stationary phase plus the mobile phase time, which is the fastest B could have moved through if it had nothing to do with the mobile phase. So it's a pretty easy calculation then. We just figure out basically how much time they spent in the stationary phase by subtracting from the retention time the mobile phase. So for example, A spent one minute in the mobile phase and three minutes in the stationary phase Hence, it has a retention time of 4. Likewise, with B, it spent 1 minute in the mobile phase and 7 minutes in the stationary phase. So we can calculate of the total time it spent in the chromatography system, what fraction of that time was spent in the stationary phase. Now I want to talk about why. Why was it that analyte A didn't really explore the stationary phase very much, but analyte B really explored it? And there's going to be a lot of different factors that will control this, but they all boil down to partition, with the exception of size exclusion chromatography. And this partition is really, think like dissolves like. Think salad dressing. If the, your analyte is oil and your column is soaked with water, then that analyte's going to zoom right over it. It's not going to spend any time whatsoever in the column. It's kind of like analyte A. It's faced with a polar column, but it's a nonpolar substance. So thermodynamically, it's not going to be driven to interact with that stationary phase, and it's going to spend very little time in it. It's going to come out really fast. Likewise, for analyte B, let's say it's really polar. Maybe it's alcohol. It's going to spend a lot of time in the stationary phase and take forever to come out of the column. So in looking at a chromatogram, 
you have to know something about the stationary phases polarity. And you have to know, once you know that, you can sort of say, ah, if peaks are coming out really late, then chemically they're very similar to the stationary phase. If they're coming out really early, then chemically they must be very different. Now, as you're going to see as we go through the specific chromatographies, there are other factors that will contribute to the partition and the speed. But this is a big important one. It's particularly important in liquid chromatography where it also can have something to do with the mobile phase. Because remember, the analyte's not choosing the stationary phase or nothing. It's choosing the stationary phase or the mobile phase. So if you manipulate the mobile phase, you can actually drive things into the column, for example, and slow them down. OK, so I want you to imagine, what if I flipped the columns to being a nonpolar column? Well, then my oil is going to soak in. It's going to take forever. And my alcohol, let's say, isn't. And it's going to come out fast. So we would switch the orders in which we would observe the two different substances. One, one that came out early on a polar column will come out late on a nonpolar column. This is just a quick reminder about polarity. One of your homework assignments this week is going to be to figure out the names of all these molecules. So if you want to stop and try to see how you do, go ahead. These are all really important molecules for solvents and the application in various types of chromatography. So it's important to know their names. You don't have to name them formally. Just kind of get one of the basic names right and take a look at all of them. And as you can see, the ones on this side are going to be very nonpolar. They don't have a lot of dipole moment. You don't see a lot of hydrogen bonding that would be possible. And the ones on the right, of course, have bonds in which electrons are not equally shared. And so that creates polarity and strong interactions with water. So a good analogy then for something that's moving through a column really fast is imagine I imagine this bug, which is called a pond skater. Hopefully you've seen them. They just sort of skate over water really, really fast. And that's because they don't actually get into the water. They just stay right on the surface of it. So a nonpolar substance moving through a column that is polar is a lot like a pond skater. It just has no interaction, and it zooms right through. So let's do some practice questions here. What fraction of time, and you might want to stop it and try to run these yourself, but one question is what fraction of time did A, B, and C spend in the stationary phase? So just like we did before, they spent one minute in the mobile phase. So anything after that had to have been spent in the stationary phase. And now which molecule is least polar, which is most? Well, I tell you it's a very polar column. So that would mean that C, which came out last, spent a lot of time with that column. So it must be polar. It must be similar to it. Whereas A came out really early. So it must be like that pond skater, just zipping right through because it has no interaction. It's something waxy and greasy, and it's not going to want to interact with a waterlogged polar column. So let's go back to our beer example. Um, I showed you this chromatogram in the first lecture, and I want you to stop and take a look at it. So this is a real deal chromatogram. It actually came from a, a method that we're going to read some more about next week. But what it is, is it's showing you a bunch of peaks. And you can see in this example that you have um, one which is saturating the detector is ethanol. And you see lots of others. And you probably, some of you will know what these chemical structures are. Some of you won't. It's actually not important because you can actually reason something about the structures from observing this data. So let's, look, let's do the first question. What's the mobile phase and what's the stationary phase? Well, the carrier gas is helium, which tells us right away it's a gas chromatic, uh, chromatogram. And the stationary phase, I won't get into the details this, this week, but it's basically ultra-2. Uh, that's the trade name for it. And then they tell you that it's a phenyl methyl silicone. Uh, to make a, non, uh, a, a phenyl methyl silicone is a fairly nonpolar waxy type of column. So what types of molecules elute early? Well, ethanol and propanol are going to be polar. So the polar ones are coming out really quickly. If the polar ones are coming out quickly, they're nothing like the column. They're just skating right through it. So that tells you that the column is going to be more nonpolar. So I hope from this qualitative discussion, you have an idea of retention time and when things come off columns, and that it has a lot to do with if they're similar or not similar. And we can quantify that, as we're going to in the next lecture, through the notion of a partition coefficient. Thanks so much, and see you next time.